Hey guys, and welcome to another Factorial Friday Facts discussion number 282, uh, 017 in sight, and I am joined with Affliction as always. Hello everyone. So this one is awesome. Uh, it's written by four different people. There's 017 release plans, there's the progress, there's some cool map gen stuff and GUI stuff. Um, so we're just going to hop right into it. Uh, this week was the time to close and finish all things that will go to 017. Not all of the things that we originally planned to be done were done. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, we could have guessed that. Um, but we just left any non-essential stuff for later, so we won't postpone the release any further. The plan is that next week will be dedicated to the office playtesting and bug fixing. Many would argue that we could just release instantly and let the players find the bugs for us, but uh, we want to fix the most obvious problems in-house to avoid many duplicate bug reports and chaos after release. Also, some uh, potential bugs like save corruptions are much easier more easily worked on in-house. So if all that goes well, then they will uh, let us know next Friday and they will plan to release the week of February 25th, which is fantastic. So to clarify, yay! I know dude, we're finally getting it, maybe, <laughs> unless they just have horrible issues with their play testing. Um, to clarify, because yeah, I saw I just... some... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to touch on the, the in-house testing. That in-house testing round is really important because, as they said, they don't want duplicate bug reports. So you, you want to catch the obvious bugs early. Right. Um, yeah, so there's that. And then uh, because some people seem confused on the forums, uh, they're saying the week of the 25th, not necessarily specifically the 25th. Um based on past releases typically they like to release earlier in the week so they have that whole week to bug fix um they have released later in the week before um, but if i had to guess it would probably be like a tuesday or something of the 20 the week that week that they would release yeah that makes sense yeah so then after release plan um since there's a lot of stuff that they would like to do before they can call 17 good enough um they'll push new things into the 017 releases as time goes on. Even as 17 becomes stable in reasonable time, we would still push things on top of it. Uh, we can still make experimental stable version numbers inside 17. Um, you know, most of the stuff shouldn't be big enough to make the game generally unstable. I've heard countless times a proposal to make small frequent releases of what we have added. This will probably be reality after 17 for some time, which is great news. I mean, I'm still kind of confused as to why they're just now realizing this is a good thing to do but um the fact they did is still really really good probably because they're getting close to the polished game that they want so the the releases aren't as big as what's going into 17 at this point right so you guys uh, can't expect even like more features um ones that they didn't manage to finish to come in during 17 at some point um <clears throat> the smaller releases will mainly contain Final look behavior, the GUI, new graphics, new sound, and sound system tweaks, and many tutorials and tweaks. It's quite a large change to our procedures, and there are many ways we'll be trying to maximize the effectiveness. Um, so, the GUI progress. Uh, there are several GUI screens that are finished. Others, most of them, are just left there as they are in 16. Um, they are a combination of new GUI styles and old ones. They sometimes look funny and out of place, but they should be sufficient. So, um, I don't know what the yellow check mark with the asterisk means but uh that means it's at the bottom of this chart newly finished things since the last update in oh. uh friday facts 277 right so we can basically see that um everything down to the technology tool tip is done um and implemented is my understanding so yes, that's correct. Basically, all the menu options, you know, low game, sound, control, all that stuff is all done. Map generator is done. Um, train GUI is done, which is fantastic. That's actually the main one I would want. Um, technology GUI as well. Um, and then you can see some of these others, like Blueprint Library is only about halfway done um, and stuff. So they would finish implementing these throughout 017. Yeah, the, that's exactly what this means. Um, Everything that has a check mark in that last column, a final review, is done. Right, which is awesome. So uh, that's good news. Uh, 
I guess moving on to the blueprint library, there's quite a bit here. There's a lot of pictures, but I don't want those to be too long. Um, so they split this into several steps. Uh, basically, the big motivation is to do the integration with new quick bar um, in time for 017, while other changes can be done after. The thing with the quick bar is that it's, you know, a pretty big change, and it uh, to one of the uh, to most of the tools in game, and people don't generally like change even when it's for the better. Minimize the hate of the change. We need to sell it properly. By that, we should provide as many of the positive aspects of the new quick bar at the time of its introduction. Uh, so the change that is already implemented in Working for 17 is the ability to put Blueprints books into the Quick Bar in a quick, uh, in a way that the Quick Bar is linked directly to the library. Um, so you don't need to have physical Blueprint items in your inventory, which is super nice. Uh, Yay! No more clutter. I know. <laughs> Fills up so much inventory space. Uh, the other change is that picking a blueprint from the blueprint library and then pressing Q will just dismiss it instead of silently pushing it into your inventory. This works the same as the clipboard. Um, you can still explicitly insert the blueprint from the library to the inventory slot, but you just pick it, use it, and press Q and it goes away. In addition, other changes related to the library will follow soon after 017. The first thing is a change of how the GUI looks. So again, this will come after the initial 17 release. And we've pretty much already seen this. I've, I'm pretty sure they've shut it off in at least one or more Friday Facts. Yeah, but basically, instead of just having a window dedicated to the blueprints only, where one side is game blueprints, the other side is personal, now personal and game are on the same side in different tabs, and you have your inventory on the left. Right, which is awesome. Makes it way easier. Yeah, and then the next thing is uh, we can switch between grid and list view. Yay! Descriptions. Woohoo! Uh, and then the next thing is the last big change is to allow to put blueprint books into blueprint books, allowing better organization, basically like a directory structure. Whenever a blueprint slash book is open, we plan to show its current location so the player knows exactly what is going on. This is turning into a file system. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a. Uh, Pretty, it can get pretty complex, but but the cool thing is that's up to you. It, you I mean, you you decide how complex you want it to be. Yeah, it just turns into your my documents folder. Yeah. Um, so the next thing is the hand. Has that ever happened to you that you have robots trying to put things into your full inventory while you pick an item from it to build something and then you just can't put it back? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, all the time. As the diligent robot should fill the last slot in your inventory by whatever they are trying to give you, wood from the tree removal is the most frequent thing. Um, this was annoying 17 from time to time, but with a new quick bar, it started to happen even more, as now um, you have only one inventory and no reserve slots in the quick bar. To solve that, we just extended the principle of the hand. When you pick something from the inventory, the hand icon appears on the slot as long as you hold the thing in your cursor, the hand stays there and prevents other things from being inserted there. This way you should always be able to return currently selected items into your inventory, which is really, really nice. So it's kind of just like a placeholder. Yep, it's saying this is where that item was that is now in your hand and nothing else can take that spot. Right. <clears throat> uh, so going into terrain generation, which is super cool. Um, Everyone has different opinions about what makes a good Factorio world. I've been working on several changes for 17, but the overarching theme has been to make the map generator option screen more intuitive, more powerful. Um, so biter bases. In 16, the size control for biter bases didn't have much effect. The frequency control drains the frequency, but also decreased the size of the bases, which wasn't generally what people wanted. For 17, they've reworked biter placement using a system similar to that uh, with which we got the resource placement under control, the size and frequ frequency controls now act more like most people would expect, with frequency increasing the number of bases and size changing the size of bases. Uh, and you can see in the new preview UI showing the effects of the enemy base controls. In reality, the preview takes a couple seconds to regenerate after every change, but the ge regeneration part is skipped in this animation. Um, this is still really nice, though, yeah. even though it takes a couple seconds that you can see it in the map preview, kind of what it's going to look like. Yeah, and I like that the uh, the sliders are actually doing what 
you think they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> that helps no, a lot. That's not the case currently. No. Uh, if you don't like the relatively uniform across the world placement providers, there are changes under the hood to make it easier for modders to do something different. Placement is now based on name noise expressions, enemy base frequency, and enemy base radius, which in turn um, references enemy base intensity. By overriding any of those, a monitor could easily create a map where biters are found only at high elevations or only near water or correlate in a replacement with that of resources or anything else they want to do, which is really cool. I can definitely see some interesting mods coming from that. Yep. More customization from mods. Good. Yep. Uh, moving down to cliffs, we've added a continuity. The game has cliffs? Yeah. The game Who uses cliffs? <laughs> <clears throat> so... They've added continuity control for cliffs. If you really like mazes of the cliffs, set it to high to reduce the number of gaps, or you can turn it way down to make cliffs very rare or be completely absent. Which is cool. You know, some people like to play in hell yeah. with max cliffs. And some people just yeah, don't want to. I, uh, I, I want to find out very quickly what is the setting that reduces cliffs to zero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <clears throat> so, biome debugging. Tile placement is based on a range of humidity and ox values. Humidity and ox being properties that vary at different points across the world uh, that are suitable for each type of tile. For example, grass is only placed in places with relatively high humidity, and desert, not to be confused with plain old sand, only gets placed where ox is high. Uh, we've taken to calling these constraints rectangles because when you plot each child's home turf on a chart of humidity and ox, they're shown as rectangles. Uh, it's hard to make sense of the rectangles just by looking at the autoplace code for each child, so I wrote a script to chart them. This allowed us to ensure that they were arranged as we wanted with no gaps between them and with overlap in some cases. So you can kind of see here. Yeah, the vertical axis is humidity, horizontal is ox. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, you can pretty much just see it's pretty self-explanatory. With zero humidity and max ox, you get red desert, pretty much anything above, like, you know, 0.25 is going to be desert or sand-ish. But then when you go uh, more the other way, you can get dirt. So you can kind of see what this looks like. Yep. Yeah, this is cool to see. And I think down below they show us um, in actual tiles, not just rectangles. Right. So having the humidity ox tile chart is well and good, but doesn't tell the whole story since tile placement also depends on a noise layer specific to each tile type and could also uh, be influenced by user adjustment auto place controls, like turning grass slider up. So to further help us visualize how humidity ox tile specific noise and auto place controls worked, um, there are a couple of alternate humidity and ox generators that simply vary them linearly from north, south, west, east, respectively. Um, and then you can debug moisture and debug ox centers to drive moisture and ox, respectively. So this kind of is basically exactly what they showed above, but, you know, like you said, without these squares, this is actually kind of what it would look like. Yeah, that, that actually looks like a cool map. i play on that map. Yeah, it does look pretty neat. Uh, this map helped us realize that rather than having controls for each different type of tile, it made more sense to just control moisture and ox, which is called terrain type in the GUI, because ox doesn't mean anything. So, yeah, this way you can, well, you can basically just see that they're controlling the terrain type and moisture um, to kind of better allow uh, you to, you know, customize the type of map you want. Yeah, so if you want... Uh, a red desert map, you need to set low humidity and high terrain type. Correct. Uh, a pet project of mine has been to put controls in the generators so that we could select generators for various tile properties um, and map creation time without necessarily needing to involve mods. This was useful for debugging, uh, but my ulterior motive was to, at least in cases where there are multiple options, show the generator information to players. A couple reasons for this is it was already possible for mods to override tile property generators via presets, but we didn't have a place to show the information in the UI. So switching between presets uh, could change 
in variables and not obvious ways. Uh, I had dreams of shipping alternate elevation generators in the game. Uh, so that's pretty cool. I, yeah. It just and allows. For, hmm? Yeah, sorry. For those of you who don't know, um, elevation in this context controls where water gets placed. Right. So obviously higher elevations won't have water, lower elevations do. Yeah. Uh, so water placement. For 016, uh, I attempted to make the shape of continents more interesting. Some people really liked the new terrain, or at least managed to find some settings that made it work for them. Others called it swampy mess. <laughs> Common refrain was that the world was more fun to explore in the 017 days, which pretty much everyone I play the, with agrees with this. In the 012 days, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. 012, sorry. Um, most people I play with agree that 012 was probably the best map generation we've had so far. Yeah, I have no experience with it, so I'm excited to see what it looks like. <laughs> uh, and you'll get to, because in 17, they're restoring the default elevation generator to one very similar that is used by 012, which means large, sometimes connected lakes. The water frequency control was confusing to a lot of people, including myself. It could be interpreted as how much water, when the actual effect was to inversely scale both bodies of water and continents, such that the high water frequency actually meant smaller bodies of water, so that for 17, the water frequency and size sliders are being replaced with scale and coverage, which do the same thing, but hopefully in more obvious ways. Uh, large scale means larger land features, while more coverage means more of the map covered in water. Uh, yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So lastly, uh, new map types. So in order to ensure decent starting area, the elevation generator always makes a plateau there, uh, which is nice. So you'll never spawn in the middle of the ocean in a lake um, so you can get a power plant running. Depending on what's going on outside the plateau, this sometimes resulted in a circular ring of cliffs around the starting point, which looked very artificial when we wanted to reduce it. In the process of that, uh, uh, of solving that problem, you create another custom generator for debugging purposes. This one simply generated that starting area plateau in endless ocean. I don't actually remember how this was useful, but at one point I directed Twinson to uh, to it to illustrate the mechanics, um, and the rest of the team really liked that that setting so much that we're making it a player selectable option. So in 17, you'll get to pick uh, between that normal type, which resembles that from 012, and island, which gives you a single largest island at the starting point. There's a slider to let you change the size of the islands, as you can see here. Um, and this is really cool. There were some people with questions in the forums like, will this be an island with land you can connect to somewhere, or is it literally just an island and water forever? And uh, the devs answered that it is an island and just water forever. So something like this would be really good for a challenge, like how many rockets can you launch with the resources you have? Um, this would not really be good for any type of extended playthrough because once you add resources, you're done, you know? Yeah. Uh, can't do a mega base with this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe you could do some interesting things with C block or something, but... Uh, yeah, like like you said, it, it's good for a challenge map type. Uh, right. See if you can launch a rocket with the resources on this map. Mm-hmm. So maps with st uh, multiple starting points will have multiple islands, uh, which is really, really cool, actually. Um, so this could be for, like, PvP, um, you know, where you just have multiple island starting points for each team. I feel like I'm going back to StarCraft with this. Yeah, I know. Island maps. <laughs> Make sure you get a dropship before you do anything. That's very important. <laughs> Uh, I'm reading this next paragraph and I'm already lost. Um, oh, here. basically, uh, those scale sliders, they're storing their values somewhere and those values are numeric. Um, so they, they're expanding the range of those sliders from plus or minus a factor of two. So instead of, um, what is it? 0.5 to two. It's going to go from 0.17 to 6 now. Okay. And it used to be just five discrete options where it was uh, very low, low, normal, high, very high. Uh, now it's an actual number, so things can get much more precise. 
uh, and then the terrain generation actually uses numeric multipliers. Um, so it it can use those values, which also means that the fact that they're, they're being used as numbers instead of discrete values means that you can edit them manually in some settings file, uh, a JSON file. Right, which uh, means that modders will be able to add their own map types to the map type dropped out. Um, if you really like the shape of flame maps in, set in 16 and want to be able to continue creating new maps with it, please let us know on the forum. So, yeah, again, I can see lots of new mods um, with this that create very specific map types um, that you can just select from the uh, map generator thing. Yeah. Um, I stand corrected. That was not the last. The last thing is high res accumulators. So on the left, we have the low res. On the right, we have the high res. In uh, the first GIF? Um, oh, no, sorry. No, on the <laughs> left is just sitting there, and the right is in use. Correct. OK. Um, so the design of the accumulators has always been good. The four very visible cylinders looking like giant batteries, Tesla poles and electric beams perfectly telegraphed its function. That's why for high-res conversion, we were very careful about keeping this entity as it was. The only thing that was a bit disturbing for some are the poles um, crossing to each other when more than one accumulator is placed in a row, so we decided to fix it or break it. The rest of the work was making the entity compatible for the actual look of the game, but in essence, accumulator is still the same. So here we go. <laughs> on the left is the low-res current version, and on the right is the new version that will be in 17, which... Basically looks identical, except again, the poles don't cross when you place them next to each other, and they obviously look a lot cleaner because they're high res. Yeah, exactly. And that's pretty much it. So, really awesome news. 17, hopefully by the end of February sometime. Uh, map gen stuff, which all looks great. New accumulators. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that was it. I mean, they, and then the progress that we talked about for... Um, you know, the GUI and stuff. Oh, and the hand. Yeah, bunch of quality of life uh, upgrades coming in, hopefully just over a week. Yeah, would be fantastic. So I think that's going to do it. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, I would You do my usual, please give me 17, but that's apparently coming in just over a week. So no, nothing else. <laughs> I agree. All right. Thanks, guys, for watching. Leave your thoughts and questions and such below and head to the forums if you want to, you know, let the devs know. And until next time, we will catch you later. See ya.